I will talk uh, about my experience uh, with the Pentacam. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, uh, my collaboration with Oculus uh, dates back to 2010, so already nine years ago, uh, when uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to work with them and do a lot of studies uh, that have been published on many topics from refractive surgery uh, to IO power calculation to toric uh, calculations. And, uh, well, um, just this. <coughs> Sorry, just have to understand. Today, I will uh, provide you with the, um, with the results of uh, different studies. The first one has not yet been published and uh, uh, these are just some preliminary data. I need to collect f uh, some more eyes uh, before submitting this one to uh, JCRS or another journal. And uh, it uh, wants, uh, I, I wanted to uh, investigate uh, the refractive outcomes of uh, Pentacama AXL for IR power calculation. So how accurate can we be with different IOL models uh, when we use the measurements from the uh, Pentacam AXL. Because uh, uh, if you are interested in uh, IOL power calculation, you know that uh, there have been uh, uh, important changes over the last uh, five, six years. New formulas, new instruments, uh, but I would say also new studies. Uh, there have been uh, at least the three major studies uh, done by different authors who showed uh, us uh, which is the current uh, situation in our power calculation. The first uh, uh, one was published in 2016 by Jack Kane, uh, a young Australian resident, uh, just 26 years old who was able to collect uh, as many as 3,200 IOLs uh, with the same model, the Acrisoft uh, SN60WF, and made a comparison between uh, different formulas, as you can see here. All measurements uh, had been made uh, with the IOL Master 500. And uh, you can see some interesting, uh, some interesting uh, data. I have uh, a lead, just a cycle. Well, what can you see from here? From here, you see that uh, in this paper, that is already three years old, he compared the Heigis formula, Hoffer Q, all of the one SRKT, the Barrett Universal 2, and this was the paper who said to the world that the Barrett 2 was one of the best, or probably the best formula. The T2, which is an uncommon formula, is a modification of the SRKT, uh, that never mm, became so famous, and the holiday too. He collected all these eyes and found that uh, we got a prediction error, he got a prediction error, lower than half a diopter, in about 70% of cases uh, for the Wooler range of axial length, from short to long eyes. So, this is uh, uh, a first uh, number that you should try to remember. We are around 70% of cases with a prediction error lower than half a diopter with the IOL Master 500. This means that this is the difference not between the target and the real refraction after surgery, but between the predicted refraction and uh, the mm, uh, actual postoperative mm, uh, refraction. Study number one. And you see that the Barrett was the best one, 72%. Then, after a few months, uh, Dave Cook uh, from uh, the United States collected a, a, a smaller sample uh, of 1,000 eyes. They were measured with both the IOL Master and the Landstar. Here you see the values, and interestingly, interestingly the IOL model was the same of uh, Dr. Kane, so the acrisophospheric. These eyes were all operated on uh, by the surgeon. So there's a, a difference. In the previous sample, uh, many eyes from many doctors, probably slight differences uh, in the surgical technique. Here, same doctor, all eyes operated uh, in the same, uh, with the same technique. 
and you see that the percentage of eyes with the prediction error lower than half a diopter was slightly better from 75 to 80% of eyes with such a small uh, prediction error. The best one, again, was Barrett. So when I read this paper, after reading the paper by Kane, I said, okay, two papers and two times Barrett number one. So maybe I go with it. With it. He presented the data also with Leinster. And uh, with Lenstar, Barrett was second. And again, we are between 75% and slightly better than, slightly more than 82, 83%. And the first one in this case was Olsen. We, you see Olsen standalone, which means the Olsen formula from uh, Thomas Olsen, Denmark. Uh, but not the one that is found on the Lenstar. The one that you can buy, purchase uh, on the internet, uh, you go, you select the FACO Optics software, you pay 2,000 euros, uh, and you get this one, and which is the difference between the Olsen formula that you can purchase uh, on your own or that you can find on some uh, optical biometers. The difference is that on the optical biometers, uh, uh, you have the latest release, which is based on the C constant, uh, where the prediction of the IOL is just based on length thickness and ACD, so just anterior segment for, to predict the position of the lens. While the standalone is older, but takes into account also axial length and keratometry to predict the position of the lens. And surprisingly, the older was better than the newer. So anyway, I want <laughs> you to remember more or less these values. Then, this is probably the most important. It has been published one year ago on ophthalmology by uh, Melles and Holiday. 13,000 eyes. So this is the largest ever uh, study published uh, with the same model again. And you see, you are with the Leinster, and you are around between 71 and 80 percent of cases. So this is the current situation when we are dealing with the IOL power calculation. And uh, the question is, uh, what about Pentacam AXL? How does it compare to those numbers? We are around, according to Kane, we were close to 70% of cases within half a diopter, according to other studies, between 70 and 80%. So this was my curiosity. We uh, uh, designed this prospective study, including three different, the three uh, IOL models that we currently use, which is the same uh, monofocal Acrisoft, the Toric monofocal Acrisoft, and the panoptics. I had to merge for this study, for this preliminary study, the results of the non-toric and toric uh, panoptics. Well, what did we get? And we simply used the K1 and K2 from the main screen, and the ACD, of course, from the epithelium, uh, and the axial length. So nothing special. We did not rely for this preliminary study on uh, total corneal power, total corneal refractive power, or other uh, corneal power measurements, they will be investigated in the future. So this is the, 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 the screenshot that you get with, with the different formulas right back. And uh, we investigated the four traditional formulas uh, the Haggis, Hopper Q, the one and, and SRKT. I always like to use them because I, I have them on Excel and I, I can do uh, constant optimization by myself uh, very easily with just a macro, clicking a button, and I get all the numbers uh, in one second. But of course, I also had to add the Barrett to formulas because this is the standard now, and I asked. Dr. Barrett to give me, to analyze the data for me, because I'm not able to use, I cannot enter this into Excel, it's not published, 
and uh, he did all the analysis for me. For each formula, we did the we calculated the prediction error, as I told you, as the difference, which is so uh, is the mm, measured post-operative measured refraction refraction minus the uh, predicted refraction. So that uh, a negative prediction error is a myopic surprise. And how did I perform constant optimization? For the four formulas on Excel, but this can be done also by the Pentacam uh, itself uh, um, in, in its uh, software. I just did it on Excel because I'm used to do this uh, and it's very easy and fast for me. And uh, these were the main outcomes, so the median absolute error and the percentage of eyes within uh, half and uh, one diopter. Why the median absolute error and not the mean absolute error? Well, in this kind of studies, I don't know if you are used to, to them, <clears throat> we uh, don't consider, we don't take as a primary outcome the mean arithmetic error, because it's zero. We want to have a zero prediction error, arithmetically speaking, because this is the, this is the result of a constant optimization. When you optimize the constants, the prediction on average, the prediction, prediction error is zero. Then you go uh, to absolute values. Because if you have a patient who ends up at minus five and another one who ends up at plus five, arithmetically, you have zero. So you think you are a perfect surgeon, but the two patients are not so happy. If you go to absolute values, while well, the absolute value is five, but you cannot use mean values, you have to use median values because the distribution of the absolute error, uh, like Professor Haggis told to us some years ago, uh, is not normal and you have to rely on median. So these are where the three samples, these are the three samples that uh, we uh, analyzed up to now. We got 77 eyes with the monofocal Acrisoft, 45 with the toric and 63 with the panoptics. And you see the numbers are quite on average, it's just a slightly shorter axial length with a trifocal. And this is quite not, not a big surprise because we have uh, uh, more hyperopic patients under, undergoing uh, clear lensectomy for uh, uh, hyperopia and presbyopia. And let's see the results of the monofocal group. And uh, you see that uh, the median absolute error ranges between 0.23, surprisingly, the Hoffer Q, the best, uh, down to 0.27. And the number of eyes with the prediction error within half a diopters is always uh, above 80%. And if you take a look at the largest and the more important uh, uh, the most important study by Holiday, you see that the results are very good, I would say. For example, the Barrett here is 85% has uh, uh, produced 85% of eyes within a half a diopter, and here with the Landstar in the big study, uh, 80%. And also the other formulas, for example, take a look at the Hoffer Q, 80% versus 73%. So a significant improvement. Of course, the samples are quite different, 77 eyes versus 13,000. But however, uh, in my clinic, mm, I'm happy to use the machine because uh, when you analyze the data and you see that they are so good, uh, you feel confident uh, for the next patients. And uh, these are the outcomes for the toric. Again, between 78 and 84%, again, the Barrett uh, number one. And take a look at this. This is the, with the panoptics. I don't have a clear explanation, but they are the best numbers ever reported in the literature. They are all, they are close to 90%. And in, in this case, uh, number one uh, is Professor Haigis uh, with a 92% of cases uh, within half a diopters. Okay, it's just 70, 63% of uh, 63 patients. But I would say that 
such a low median absolute error is uh, um, from 0.1 to 0.2 and a very high percentage of eyes with a very small prediction error is a very good result for patients looking for spectacle independence with uh, uh, trifocal IOLs. So in conclusion, uh, uh, the results are quite promising with a very good results. Uh, of course, to get this, you need to optimize the constants. They are not very different from those that you find on the Yuli website uh, for, for the IOL master, but they are not exactly the same. So my suggestion is always to collect the post-operative data since the first eye you use with the penta you measure with the pentacam axl you take uh, you register you record the power of the lens that you implanted you record the, the one month three weeks one month uh, refraction and either you enter these values in the pentacam or uh, in any other device or excel file or whatever you want and uh, you calculate the uh, const optimized constants for the pentacam. Uh, for the Huygens formula is a little bit more difficult but not so complicated because we, you know you have three constants and so it takes a little bit more time but it can be done. Uh, on the other hand uh, even if with the trifocal IOS the percentage of eyes with a prediction error lower than half a diopter was excellent uh, around 90 percent we still have to consider that about 10% of eyes will end with a prediction error higher than 0.5. So that means a myopic or hyperopic error of 0.75 or rarely one diopter. So uh, I think that everybody using multifocal IOS of any kind uh, has to uh, say to the patient that uh, the risk of doing uh, a procedure like LASIK, a LASIK touch-up, a PRK touch-up after surgery to correct for the small residual error is something that has to be taken into account and patients must, be, must know this before they start uh, um, uh, IOL power calculation. If they agree that a second step, rarely, maybe one case is out of 20 or out of, out of 30, uh, can occur, then it's okay. And this happens, I think, to everybody doing this kind of surgery. So I still have some time. And uh, I would like also uh, to talk about the advantages for toric calculators, uh, calculations, as I previously discussed with uh, uh, Professor Offert. Well, you know that uh, uh, Pentacam can uh, um, provide you with uh, two different values. You have the keratometric astigmatism based on K1 and K2, uh, which is uh, something close to uh, what we are used to, say, to call simulated keratometry, SIMK. And this is an estimation. So you just start from the anterior corneal curvature measurements, the anterior radius, and uh, based on uh, previous models, and uh, this uh, famous 1.3375 keratometric index, uh, you get an estimation of the total corneal uh, power. Or you go to the power distribution display, which is probably my favorite display in the Pentacam, or at least the one that I use most, and uh, you get the total refractive corneal power, which is uh, not an estimation, but a direct measurement of uh, to anterior and posterior corneal astigmatism combined together. This is something different from true net power, which is a, a, an addition of anterior plus posterior, while total corneal refractive power is measured by ray tracing, so it's not a, a, a mathematical addition. And what do we know about the posterior and total corneal astigmatism? There have been many studies showing that the posterior steepest meridian is almost always vertically aligned. This has been shown with the Pentacam, but also with other OCT and other Shenfield cameras. And what happens with the posterior steepest meridian? It happens that uh, 
you generate it generates an against the rule astigmatism which partially compensates anterior with the rule astigmatism and is added to anterior against the rule astigmatism some examples example number one you have a, a with the rule astigmatism uh, we know that in this case k1 and k2 overestimate the total corner refractive power or total corner astigmatism why you see here that you got according to k1 and k2 1.4 diopters with the rule so you would use uh, a t3 or even a t4 uh, alcon if you are used to that terminology but if you take a look at total corner refractive to the total corneal astigmatism the number is 0.6 <coughs> so you get down from 1.4 to 0.6 which is a big difference it means to use a totally different cylinder for your toric IOS of course uh, this is not always like this this is an example to make mm, things clear and the opposite happens in this eye with uh, an irregular against the rule astigmatism where you get 1.9 astigmatism according to k1 and k2 and 2.8 so almost one diopter of a difference between uh, simulated keratometry or k1 and k2 what uh, any way you want to call it and total corneal astigmatism directly measured by the uh, by the pentacam so another time uh, you got uh, a different a totally different uh, toric uh, IOL selection these were the results that we uh, published uh, some years ago with Dr. Naser from Denmark uh, and this is the average difference in eyes uh, with with the rule astigmatism you have an overestimation by k1 and k2 of about 0.22 diopters and the opposite happens uh, in eyes with against the rule astigmatism where you got an underestimation of the same amount these numbers were referred to candidates to toric IOLs, uh, which are the ones where we are interested that means people with more than one diopter of corneal astigmatism the dif a difference higher than 0.5 diopters between uh, keratometric astigmatism and uh, total corneal astigmatism was found uh, in 16% of cases while the difference in the axis was uh, a difference uh, higher than 10 degrees was found uh, in a lower percentage of cases but be careful because uh, if you just remember 0 0.21, 0 0.22 okay this is the difference uh, and I'm gonna use that number you will not be accurate because the posterior, posterior corneal astigmatism is not the same in all eyes it's uh, just uh, correlated the magnitude is uh, correlated to the magnitude of uh, uh, the keratometric astigmatism this is quite obvious if you have five diopters of the on the anterior surface of the eye five diopters of astigmatism it's likely that you have a higher astigmatism on the back surface of the eye so this is the reason for this uh, graph showing the correlation between posterior and anterior stigmatism but just talking like this and showing examples is interesting helps you to understand but does not tell us if uh, it is really good if it is the best choice to rely on total corneal astigmatism for our calculations so together with uh, Dr. Naser uh, we did a study published in 2015 on uh, IOVS which for the first time uh, demonstrated that total corneal astigmatism improves the results of toric, calcula toric IOL implantation why? because of these numbers well if you use K1 and K2 in this case they were not from the pentagon they were from another device if you use k1 and k2 you get an overcorrection of uh, 0.59 diopters a lot of studies then uh, mm, uh, revealed similar results and uh, if you use k1 and k2 sim k you got an undercorrection of uh, the ref uh, refractive astigmatism of 0.32 
then you use rather than using K1 and K2, you use TCA, total corneal astigmatism, by the pentacam, and wow, the uh, overcorrection disappeared, almost disappeared, so minus 0.13 and plus 0.07 for uh, uh, respectively with the rule and against the rule of stigmatism. So this was the first demonstration. Of course, there is still a large variability. We were able with the total coordinate astigmatism to center our error on the zero, like you can see from these graphs. So this was before with the rule uh, astigmatism over correction and against the rule under correction, and we moved everything around this, the center, but we got better results. And what we know that the Pentacam provides us with different readings because you can center on the pupil, on the apex, use the ring. I don't know who is used to use the uh, power distribution display, but uh, you can go zone, ring, apex, pupil. And for this study, and also for the following studies, we use the um, pupil zone uh, measurements. Uh, this is uh, an example showing the uh, again the differences. You get uh, this is a real example who underwent a surgery. Uh, well, if you take a look at the K1 and K2 in the first row, the astigmatism is 0.7, and it becomes uh, 1.2. It's an against the rule astigmatism with a total corneal astigmatism. So in this case, we implanted a T3, and if we had followed uh, the K1 and K2 0.7, there would have been uh, uh, is light uh, under correction. And this is another case uh, with different machines showing around 2.5, 2.7 diopters, uh, slightly oblique. Then uh, you take the Pentacam, very similar result, it's not surprising, K1 and K2. But if you take the total corneal refractive power on the power distribution, what happens? It goes down to 1.8. So should I follow four machines suggesting me 2.5 or one machine that mm, gives me this number? I already know, I, I will follow this one. Not because uh, it's one against four, because this is total corneal astigmatism versus keratometric astigmatism. And uh, this is the, how the machine works now with the Pentacam AXL and the new software, uh, the latest software. Well, uh, you have all the measurements given by the machine, so you select the IOL model. You can select the IOL formula, Holiday 1, SRKT, whatever you want, the Barrett. You see the calculated IOL power. If you want to use the TCA, total corneal astigmatism, you select Savini Toric which includes these values. So total corneal refractive power, three millimeters, zone pupil, you cannot change this. These are uh, by default. And you got the 1.8 diopters that I showed before. And uh, finally, also the prediction of the cylinder with the T5 by Alcon. And uh, the, uh, the refraction, final refraction was plain. Uh, I'm sure that if I had used a, a stronger um, a, a T6 uh, to correct 2.5 rather than a T5, uh, I would have uh, uh, produced uh, an uh, overcorrection of the cylinder. There have been uh, some earlier studies dating back to 2016-2017 showing higher accuracy using estimated total corneal astigmatism by, for example, by Barrett or the, you know there's uh, the Abulafia Koch uh, toric calculator and these papers reveal that uh, estimated values were better, slightly better, than uh, direct total, uh, direct total corneal astigmatism measurements. And uh, uh, together with uh, the collaboration of Oculus uh, and with the latest uh, software update, this one, we were able, there have been some improvements over uh, for, for calculation leading to the same uh, results with uh, estimated values uh, and total corneal astigmatism, which are much better than simple K1 and K2. So there was a further improvement, as you can see from here. 
if you look at the mean absolute error in toric power is okay this is still slightly better with barrett there were these were 58 eyes but not a big difference 0 0.65 versus 0 0.55 if you take the eyes with an absolute error in the <coughs> cylinder refraction prediction lower than 0.75 diopters almost the same 67 versus 68 percent not a big difference why if you take a look at the centroid that is the mean difference between predicted and post-operative astigmatism it was slightly better with pentacam so this is just to say that uh, you can use uh, uh, all these measurements uh, and have uh, better results for sure compared to standard methods using K1 or K2 from any manufacturer and any company. And uh, just going back to this, uh, you see that when you have the Pentacam, you use the uh, AXL software, I told you Take a look at the uh, Savini Toric calculator, which is just the, the total corneal astigmatism. But on the right side, you can use the Barrett calculator. So you can look at them uh, one by one. So you can see the results of direct measurements and the results of estimated measurements. And uh, when you're dealing with uh, patients with multifocal Toric IOS, if you find the same outcome, the same prediction for both calculators, so you can feel very confident and go on. If you have big discrepancies between direct measurements and estimated values, so that's the moment to take measurements again and be very um, careful with the patients and maybe uh, advise him that it might be necessary uh, to do, a, that you, you don't feel so sure about uh, your power calculation and that maybe a LASIK touch-up in one case out of 20 might be necessary.